Good evening and welcome to everybody. Uh, warm welcome to our booklet launch and panel discussion here tonight on the militarization of the EU and the presentation of our booklet, A Militarized Union. Glad to see you all here. If you um, would like to have German interpretation that we're offering, then you find the German um, channel in our chat below. And um, Erdem Dimirel will be speaking in German, so you'll also find the English translation then um, in the Zoom bar below um, for our discussion later on. My name is Axel Ruppert um, from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's uh, Brussels office, and I'll be guiding you through um, this evening. Interestingly enough, just a couple of hours, actually, just before our event, um, the European Commission, together with the representatives from the European arms industry, has now officially launched the European Defence Fund. Um, so now for the next years, um, overall 7.95 billion euros from the EU budget will be handed out to the European arms industry. And from our perspective, this is not only violating EU treaties, um, but also stands exemplary of the EU's shift from civil to military priorities, in particular over the recent six years. At the same time, the Future Combat Air System, the FCAS project, um, has recently attracted criticism um, for the massive costs that it is and, and will be causing um, even before any plane has ever taken off. It also shows the, the competition between member states over, over technological ownership and protecting their own industries and is already undermining the promises that came with a closer cooperation on a military level at EU level. And lastly, by, by incorporating autonomous drone swarms, um, the AFCAS project um, will exacerbate the global arms race on autonomous weapons, another development um, that we'll have to watch out for. And finally, following the recent NATO summit and the apparent um, US orientations toward the Pacific, we have once again heard calls for the EU to take care of its own defense and security and invest in its strategic autonomy, whatever this might mean. So these calls have again become stronger and louder. So these are just some highlights that I want to share before we start that I think show how, how relevant, how timely and how topical and at the same time important our discussion is tonight. Um, and despite these, these alarming developments, and this is also where we, where we start from, um, where we started from discussing um, our booklet that we're presenting tonight, is that these alarming developments, the militarization of the EU, what it means for peace and safety of people in and outside of Europe, and what it means for taxpayers in the EU, how the arms industry is profiting from it, and to what extent the EU is preparing for war is publicly not well known, even among those who um, we see as part of the left and political spectrum in Europe. And our booklet, The Militarized Union, uh, Understanding and Confronting the Militarization of the European Union that we present tonight seeks to address specifically this. Um, it offers a comprehensive introduction to the discourses, structures, and actors at the core of the militarization of the EU. It also seeks to deconstruct um, myth about the supposed economic and political benefits of closer military cooperation, explain why this paradigm shift threatens peace and human security worldwide, um, but also presents peace policy concepts and approaches um, to take action. And this booklet has been written um, by authors from the European Network Against the Arms Trade. Um, and at, uh, yeah, at this point here also a big um, thank you um, to the European Network Against Arms Trade um, for, for putting this together and, um, and for making this um, possible also based on the, um, on the work of the members of the, of the network in recent years on this topic. The booklet is now out in English. I'll share the link in the, in the chat. Um, but it will be translated um, to German, French, and Spanish. So we are very much looking forward to discussing this booklet tonight. Um, and at the same time, take stock of where we currently stand after the launch of the EDF today, um, but also the introduction of the Permanent Structured Cooperation PESCO, the Coordinated Annual Review on Defense Card, and um, also the adoption of the EU Peace Facility. I want to take the opportunity tonight as well to look ahead and discuss what will matter in the coming month 
and how we can effectively confront the further, further militarization of the European Union. And to do so, I'm very glad um, to welcome Aslem Dimiril here with, with us. Aslem, you are a member of the European Parliament, um, vice chair of the subcommittee on security and defense, member of Die Linke and the left, and I would say a very important voice um, within the left um, on EU militarization um, and on criticizing this process and um, bringing it to broader public um, attention. So we're really looking forward to your, um, to your assessment um, and, and to your opinion um, later on. And I would also like to warmly welcome uh, Leticia Sidou. Uh, Leticia, your EU program officer at European Network Against Arms Trade. Um, and you've been vital in, in bringing this, um, this booklet to life. So at this point, also a big thank you um, to you um, for, for our cooperation over the recent months and weeks in, in making this possible. And last but not least, um, Bram Franken. Um, Bram, you are a researcher and campaigner at Friedes Axia, a member of the INAT EU program steering group. And um, you've been researching the influence of the arms industry um, on the process of EU militarization. And you've done um, comprehensive research on the lobby efforts of um, the arms industry and arms and security industries um, in Europe. So we're also looking very much forward um, to your expertise in our discussion later on. Um, regarding our next points on the agenda, I've been talking enough now. So um, in a minute, I'll hand over to uh, Leticia and Bram um, to give us an introduction to the booklet, um, to share what's in it, um, what perspective um, did we take in addressing the topic um, and offer you an overview um, of what you'll find in it. Following this, um, we will have a statement by Özlem Dimiril um, that will then also set the stage, uh, set the stage um, for our discussion that will follow. And for this discussion, we really seek to have it as interactive as possible. Um, so we would like um, to include your questions from the very beginning. Um, you can do so by using the Q&A box. So if you have a question, um, please feel free to write it in the Q&A box. Um, but you can also um, take part here on the panel um, if you use the raise hand function that you should find in the Zoom bar below. You can um, raise your hand and we will then promote you to panelists and you can switch on your camera and microphone and ask a question or share your comment here on the panel. And we would like to do that actually from the very beginning. So please don't hesitate in asking your questions or raising your hand. Um, we'd like to open up um, the discussion here um, as soon as possible. Regarding technical aspects, this event is being recorded um, and we will publish it later on our YouTube channel. So if that is an issue for you, um, please let us know um, and we can take care of that in the later, in the later video editing. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my colleague, Luisa Schmidt, um, who's with us tonight. Um, if you should face um, a problem, I think it should be possible for you to contact Luisa via the chat and um, start a private chat uh, with Luisa should you have any technical um, problems along the way. I hope that I didn't forget anything important by now. Um, if so, we'll find out along the way. And without further ado, I would like to hand over the word um, to Leticia for an introduction to the booklet. Thank you very much, Axel. Um, well, I'm very honored to be here and to be able to present these booklets today to everybody. First, of course, a big thank you to the Rosa Luxembourg Foundation who made this booklet possible and all the support and work put in it. and, and, and uh, including translation and this, this event today. I'd like also to mention the four other authors so uh, that have contributed to these booklets, uh, which are all members of the, uh, of the ENAT steering group and uh, member of organizations of the, of the group. Uh, so I will briefly share my screen. Let me a moment for this. Um, the idea to introduce the the group will be to, sorry, to briefly uh, explain what is in the booklet. 
and then from there explore a bit uh, two main issues which are to see sorry um, two main issues about the role of the arms industry and the uh, militarization dimension. So let's see first what are the questions that our booklet intends to answer. And of course, uh, the first question is about when did this happen? How this EU militarization happened? What are the main steps of the process? And most importantly, what was the role of the arms industry? And we will come back to that uh, later on with, with Graham. The second aspect was to try and understand why. So uh, why is this happening now? What is the political discourse behind the narrative to justify it? And also explore, as Excel started to mention, whether there is a common understanding of the what for and where this process should lead the EU to. The third chapter uh, is probably the more complex one, but also very important about the who and the what. So questions about who initiated, who decides, who is implementing those policies. But also what are those different policies and programs? What are they concretely about? How much money is dedicated to them? And last but not least, who benefits from, from them? Yet the political narrative is not sufficient to explain these policies, programs, and the significant budgets that are dedicated to it recently. So there are also economic and industrial interests behind. This is what the chapter four explores and also tries to explain whether this will contribute to job and growth or not, whether this will lead to savings and avoiding duplications or not. But EU militarization also raises numerous concerns about its impact on peace, as Alex introduced. Will this EU hard power really contribute to peace and safety, not only in Europe, but also worldwide? What is the impact of arms exports on conflicts and on violence? Are they the cause or the consequence? And lastly, we try to conclude the booklet on a more positive tone and hope, proposing alternatives. What other security narrative is possible? What should you do instead of militarizing? How can you help and engage as a citizen? In order to answer all these questions, the booklet intends to provide you with different resources, with facts and figures to control the official narrative, with references for further reading, with accessible material, with sources for going more in depth from official to media or academic references and examples of campaigns and actors to engage and to take action. And with that, I hope you will enjoy the reading. And now I think Bram, uh, whether, I don't know whether Axel you want to jump in. If not Bram, I think you can jump in directly on the arms industry. Okay, many thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk today. I will also share my screen, so minutes of patience. So I will highlight uh, the role of the arms industry because this is one of the core elements of the booklet. Uh, what is the role of the arms industry? How it is influencing EU policies? I want to start by... I want to start by showing a graphic. So this shows uh, how the EU budget for security and military policies has exploded in the last 20 years. So at the beginning of the 2000s, there was no budget at all uh, for security and military spending. Um, you have the first program coming up in, um, in the 2000s, 2007, 2013, there is a security research budget of 2.8 billion euros. And Gradually, this this increased um, to the to the budget for the coming budgetary period of 2021 to 2027 to 20 million euros, uh, 20 billion euros. Yes. So there has been a real explosion in EU budgets for security and military spending. So how did this happen? Um, 
in the last 20 years, we have seen that EU, EU policies and the EU arms lobby have become increasingly intertwined. And uh, I think this is, um, there is a quote from an arms lobbyist uh, from Raytheon who once said, and I think this, is, this really describes well the process which is going on. And he said during a webinar, um, we are not vendors, we are partners. And that's how the arms industry is seeing itself in relation to the European Union. This quote is reflected by the arms lobbying group ASD, which described itself as um, being, constant, being constant in close dialogue with both the European Commission and European Defense Agency. But it's not just the arms industry which sees, sees itself as an ally and a partner to um, these European institutions, but it's also the European Union itself, which is defining itself in relation to the arms industry. For example, last year, you have the EU High Representative for uh, Foreign Affairs, Josef um, Borrell, who said, I'm strongly convinced that the future of the European defense will start from the European defense industry. Um, so, which I think is quite um, astonishing that, um, that this support for this European defense arms industry is out in the open. And already in 2005, uh, the researcher Frank Slaper wrote the influence from the industry and policy making processes is astonishing for the un uninitiated outsider to see. So it's no coincidence that today, on the official launch of the European Defense Fund, the arms industry is one of the, of the main entities. Uh, one, there are uh, several speakers today in the official launch of the European Defense Fund who are from Taos, Airbus, and other arms companies. Um, to present their interests. And I want to I want to focus on a couple of ways that the, the EU arms lobby is functioning and how they are pushing for increased um, militarization. Um, small technical problem, but that's okay. Uh, so the first. The first way that the EU arms industry is um, defending its interest is by just establishing new agencies. So you have the European Defense Agency, which was established in 2003, and where the arms industry played a vital role in making sure that this uh, defense agency ever came into existence, which is also admitted by the European Defense Agency on its own website, where they have uh, the history of the agency and how they came into existence, thanks to all the good work of the European arms industry. And of course, um, one of the main objectives of the European Defense Agency is to defend the interests of, uh, of the industry. So here you have um, agencies where um, the European defense industry has been lobbying for, which then start defending on the institutional level the interests of that industry. The same is the case for uh, the new DG for the defense industry, which is part of the, which is this administration of the European Commission, and which also has as a stated ob objective to uh, improve the competitiveness of the European defense industry. So that's um, the first one. Second one is uh, how the arms industry is functioning is through advisory bodies. And one of the most famous advisory bodies where the defense industry was represented in was the group of personalities. So that group was set up in 2015. And as you can see on the slides, uh, was highly dominated by the defense industry. There were more people from the defense industry in that advisory body um, than there were people from uh, the EU institutions or from the parliament. Um, so there was a huge, there was a huge dominance by the defense industry in this group. Uh, afterwards, they, um, they gave advice to the European Commission, which then led to uh, the establishment of the European Defense Fund, of which um, 
Then Commissioner uh, Bienkowska of PT Pro said good news for the defense industry, new European defense fund before the end of the year. And also we see that the companies which are benefiting most until now from these, fund, from these funds are the same companies that were represented in the global personnel. The last way that the EU defense industry has been able to uh, establish um, influence and contacts is of course the true revolving doors. So that's a um, quite traditional way of um, influencing policies of ha or having good connections with, with institutions uh, by just hiring the people who used to work for those institutions. And a very high level case, of course, is uh, the previous CEO of the European Defense Agency who seven months after he uh, finished his mandate as a CEO for the European Defense Agency, uh, jumped to Airbus uh, and started lobbying uh, for Airbus. So how can we resist um, the arms industry? And I think there are a couple of ways. And the first one is exposing counter the narrative. So uh, a lot of these um, wheelings and dealings of the defense industry are taking place behind closed doors. There is not a lot of attention or not even a lot of transparency. So first, uh, the first thing we have to do is to make sure that um, these practices are being exposed and made public. Um, secondly, we have to counter the narrative. So the things that the defense industry and the Euro European institutions are uh, using as arguments are always the same. First, um, we, need, we need the industry uh, for jobs. And second, we need the industry for our, secu sec our security. And I think in the booklet, we clearly show that these arguments are just absurd. First of all, um, the economic, um, the economic word of the defense industry is, is, is rather small. Um, there is very little proof that um, cooperation uh, by the industry on an EU level leads to more efficiency. Um, and of course, more important, we know that the EU defense industry is not leading to more safety because we see what is happening in Yemen, for example, or other conflicts um, in the Middle East where uh, European arms industry has played a big role in sustaining and uh, these conflicts by, by selling weapons over uh, EU governments have done nothing to stop this. Another way to, and then this, the third way we have to um, resist the arms industry is by confronting it. So we have to confront uh, this military, militaristic approach. Um, so what, we all know what um, arms companies hope to achieve, and that's to maximize economic profits. Uh, and they can only make uh, these profits by selling uh, to their clients. And these clients are governments, so they should be accountable to us. Um, so we know that their income is public money, so we can confront, that, conf confront them there, go to their shareholder meetings, condemn their products and clients, and obstruct arms service, block ports, and prevent ships from leaving European shores with weapons and ammunition. So that's that's how we can, that's how I believe we can confront uh, the arms industry. Uh, and I believe that uh, we should know, going to talk a bit more about the processes of uh, military research. Yes, thank you, Bram. Uh, so the last uh, aspect we want to address, and I will also share again my screen. Here we are. So uh, what I'd like now to uh, to share is a few elements about um, why we say, why do we speak about EU militarization? Uh, it may sound very obvious for us, but as you probably have seen that very regularly, this claim is regularly discredited as being ideological. So what are the facts and arguments to support our statements? The first point, of course, is to start with the basics. What does that mean? What does militarization mean? 
And we need first to clarify that militarization is not about having an army, in that case, an EU army or not, which is the most common argument uh, we are opposed with. In fact, there are four elements that characterize a militarization process. One is to give a military character or functioning. The second is to answer to or to adapt to military needs. The third is to prepare for war, in particular with equipment and training. And the fourth is, of course, about taking military actions. So let's see now concretely to which extent the recent developments we describe in this booklet meet those criteria or not. And I reassure you, I'm not going to go through all the details of this, but the idea is to see that we have our, our criteria and the main policies and programs. And you will find, of course, all the details in the booklet. The first element to consider is that uh, only three of these main policies I highlighted are intergovernmental. That means decided, funded, mainly decided and funded under control of the member states with a rather limited involvement of the Commission, not to say the Parliament. This is the PESCO, the Permanent Structural Cooperation, the Peace Facility, here below, and together with the EU missions. The other policies that are here are, in fact, initiated by the Commission, funded by the EU budget, with the blessing of the Parliament. And this is already a fundamental paradigm shift, which has broken the red line and the taboo about not funding military-related activities with the EU budget. And I guess that Mrs. Demerwell will tell us more about that. And this started in 2016 with the adoption of the preparatory action on defense, we showed, and that has been seriously accelerated since then, as Bram showed us uh, with, with the budget. So what are those different programs about? Um, the first ones, two first ones are about answering military needs. The PESCO is to encourage military cooperation between member states, the defense fund is to strengthen the European arms industry. But in both cases, they ultimately want to provide the member states with new or enhanced military capabilities. Then another step of militarization was taken when the president of the commission, Juncker, asked in 2017 to all commissioners to find ways to answer the military needs within their civilian programs. So this led to a number of programs, of civil programs, aiming to adapt infrastructures like transport to favor military mobility, or the space program uh, to, to ac facilitate access of the space facilities for military actions and resources, like in that case, attracting skilled youth for military uses. And that's only the main examples. And then even the external aid uh, budget has been solicited under the concept of what is called security for development, the idea that security is needed for development. Um, and so part of the budget is now used to train and to equip security, so that includes military forces in the, the identified partner countries in the south, and that can refer to a country like Mali, for example. Um, and the peace facility that has been recently adopted and that will start this year, which is funded by national contributions, is also taking this policy of train and equip to a higher scale, and which will allow the delivery of lethal equipment to those uh, partner countries. The peace facility. The peace facility is also about facilitating uh, military missions. That is military interventions in the field, so not formal occupation, but part of military action. But answering those military needs and military capabilities do not happen just for the sake of it. So whether it is intended or not, developing this capacity will also facilitate military interventions, either from the EU or from the member states, and the material preparation for war. However, preparation for war is not about uh, only about the material, the, the, the equipment. It's also, on a broader perspective, about the symbolic and cultural preparation for war and about an intentional process. So if we take the symbolic dimension at EU level, uh, we can see that when facing critics, the promoters of the EU militarization try to downplay it, to isolate it as industrial programs. But in fact, in public, the EU leaders refer to these developments as historical steps, as a new consensus for Europe, 
and the present little progress towards uh, the, the progress towards European defense is seen as the miracle formula to seduce sectarian European citizens, putting it on the same foot as the internal market or the euro. So it's definitely not a, a insignificant process. From the cultural preparation for war, this means preparing people mindsets to the natural or obvious necessity of developing military capabilities. So completely uh, outsiding any alternative vision. The first aspect is of course the economic narrative that Ram already touched upon it, claiming that this would save jobs and growth and that this would lead to savings and avoiding duplication. You will find in the booklet ample elements that demonstrate this is absolutely not true starting with the fact that EU, PESCO and NATO all together still encourage or even constrain member states to increase their military spending on top of the uh, billions coming from the EU budget. The second narrative is about securitization. So by securitization, we mean the process through which political problems or societal challenges like climate change in particular are identified and dealt with as security issues. So at the EU level, this translates uh, into describing the European way of life as facing multiple threats and thus the need for a Europe that protects, which is the new motto repeated over and again at EU level. The last element that according to the definition we are using uh, is about intentions. There is no doubt that uh, this process is an intentional process. We have seen it is initiated by the EU and it is agreed upon by the EU decision makers with very large majorities. What is not necessarily that clear is about the, the, the final objective, the intention for the EU project. There is no consensus as mentioned, as was mentioned by Axel on what European defense may mean, what strategic autonomy mean, autonomous from whom, uh, nor a common uh, military um, strategy shared. However, what is clear that considering the securitization narrative and that new challenges like climate change may not be properly addressed, this means that those EU-funded military capabilities will be very useful to defend the European geostrategic and economic interests and to defend the uh, European hegemony at large. So this raises, of course, the, the concern about the impact of EU militarization on peace and safety. Bram already mentioned the question of the arms exports. This militarization will definitely exacerbate the global arms race. The Defense Fund, for example, aims to boost the global competitiveness of the industry. That means more arms exports. And as, uh, as Bram mentions, a significant part of those exports go to areas under conflict of tension or authoritarian regime. And the research has demonstrated the correlation with refugee flows. Another important impact, which is contrary to what is being officially claimed, is the fact that becoming a hard power would reinforce the EU as a soft power. Our argument is that this will be rather the contrary. Year in, year out, so far, the EU was considered a rather neutral actor based on value, with all the limits we, we can see to it, but still this was a, a large perception in the field. Militarization will definitely change this perception. And on top, it will, of course, divert human and financial resources from peaceful solutions. Indeed, claiming that doing both at the same time is possible and that the fight against the root causes of conflicts and major challenges like climate change will remain a priority is not credible. First, because it's already not happening. It did not happen before. So why should it happen now with an increased competition between policies that are even contradicting each other? And also second, because the military way looks easier, is made more popular thanks to the political narrative and the securitization narrative we mentioned. And not to say, of course, because of the over influence of the military uh, industry complex that Graham mentioned. So what can we do? I can only but go, of course, to the, the path that Graham already opened, which is countering the narrative. Uh, because it's not a question of one vision against another one. It's because many of the arguments are just wrong from the beginning. So that's something important, I think, to also uh, work on. 
engage and take action, of course. Bram gave some examples. Here you see also examples of actions at EU level. But I insist that the national level is very important because the decisions are from the member state or from MEPs who also are part of national context. So we need also to change the paradigm, to change the narrative and the mindsets to build the basis for a peaceful alternative. So not only control the, their own narrative, but also bring elements for an alternative. And well, I do hope that this booklet will help you to do so. And with that, we give you back the floor, Axel. Great, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Leticia and Bram, uh, for this overview. And yeah, uh, you two as the authors of the of the booklet as well. Um, as well, uh, a big thank you for for your contributions in the booklet. And I think what your presentations um, showed, and what is also one of the attentions um, of the booklet, is to show how deep this process of EU militarization um, actually goes, how far-reaching it is. Um, that it's not um, a thing that happened overnight, that it has a history, that, that it's built up and that it's clearly um, a profiteer of it. And this is the, this is the arms industry. Um, now, I would like um, to give the floor to um, Özlem Demiril um, for sharing, let's say, um, a state of the art that um, then also sets the stage for our later on discussion. And um, yeah, we'd be very keen to hear as well about the um, lawsuit um, that the left uh, German Die Linke actually um, filed at the German um, Constitutional Court um, against the European Defense Fund um, and linked to that. Um, and this is, I think, also very interesting for our discussion later on um, how we confront um, this process and which tools we can use um, on the way doing so for the coming months and years. So, Aslim, looking forward to your contribution. Thank you, Axel. I'm going to speak German. I hope that's fine. Um, hopefully, the English translation is working. If not, uh, let us know. I can also speak English, but I do prefer German because, um, yeah, that helps me to really convey the message that I want to uh, come across. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Rosa Luxemburg uh, Stiftung, to Bram and Leticia for this study and the booklet, uh, which I'm sure um, meant a lot of intense work uh, on this topic of militarization, because it is a very well hot topic, so to speak. Um, it is a topic which suddenly is really being moving forward and pushed forward, uh, really, at, at uh, high speed and that's really really worrying when i speak to uh, citizens in my country and in other eu member states i always feel like well um people are of the opinion yes um, the european union is uh, based on values the european union is even uh, has even been awarded the um, peace nobel prize and so that doesn't work when you think about the fact that now um, we are looking at militarization, but that's the part that a lot of people are not aware of. Um, they don't even know about it. And that's uh, something that I find very worrying um, for now and for the future. But um, first of all, um, just one fact from Germany. In Germany, um, a military mission came to an end. Uh, our mission in Afghanistan, the German mission in Afghanistan, came to an end today after 20 years. And um, from the beginning, the left, the Linke in Germany, criticized this um, mission, this deployment. Um, we uh, always criticized uh, that this is uh, yeah, just a succession of useless wars or against terrorism, as they were called. And we always said that these bombs, these wars will not help to combat terrorism. They will just uh, cost lives and will, uh, will cause a lot of suffering. But still, this war um, was fought uh, for 20 years. Now, there was a lot of support in Germany as well, because people said, well, this is how human rights will be defended, or even women's rights um, will be defended and fought for. Uh, so we, in turn, were then criticized because we were um, opposed to this deployment. But now, 20 years on, 
uh, I can say with hindsight that our criticism was correct. I wish I was wrong, but unfortunately we were right from the start. This military mission, this military deployment has not improved the situation in Afghanistan at all. On the contrary, the situation of, of women hasn't improved and the Taliban hasn't um, been fought or defeated and they are actually uh, more powerful than before in some areas and are more encrusted in the, in the political structures there. So I think that's a very recent experience that we've been able to gain um, from uh, recent history. And I think we should learn from that. And we can see now on a European level where um, people say, well, there are worrying developments worldwide. There are dangerous uh, structures and um, we have to fight them, but of course, we cannot fight them on a military level. That's what we have to make very clear. And uh, in order to make that clear, I think it helps um, to point towards these recent developments, for example, in Afghanistan. I'm very happy that this um, mission in Afghanistan has been ended, but of course, I'm also aware of the fact that people in Afghanistan will not be better off with the end of this mission, that there will still be escalation. So we have to find other answers, other responses, civil support, um, civil um, capacity building. Malala Lajua also mentioned that she um, and the Afghan peace movement says, say that they need support uh, for, uh, for um, educational infrastructure, for example. They, they need uh, civil help and not military help. Wichtig oder wichtig, jetzt am Anfang zu erwähnen. So why is this um, deployment important? Why did I mention it? Well, because we can see that uh, Europeans are involved in global wars and um, we can see that there are some global powers who fight for their military interests. And uh, even if you want to defend your values, um, they tell us that they can only do so on a military level or that this military level is important. However, that shouldn't mean that democratic solutions or participatory solutions uh, should be um, put aside. Um, because uh, military threats, for example, um, can cause their own kind of dynamics. We're talking about arms technologies, for example, where we are in a kind of competition or arms race with the US and China. We're talking about different uh, defense uh, funds, etc. So there's an entirely new dynamic, entirely new threats, um, which could be uh, leading to massive uh, distractions and dramatic consequences worldwide, something that we cannot even conceive right now. The European Union, it's always being said, is a peace union, a union of peace. But in the Lisbon Treaty, for example, there were already elements of um, the um, permanent structured cooperation. Um, they were there already, but they weren't activated. Uh, with Brexit, however, this um, approach and PESCO was activated. And that means the first step towards military capacity building of the European Union has uh, was taken at um, the first sign of Brexit. So member states were asked to commit to um, military, uh, militarizing, uh, to committing to the uh, military funding, etc. And now we have budget lines in our budget for the first time, which have a clearly military um, a component. It's, uh, doesn't just consider the um, defense fund, but we're also talking about budget lines um, who um, are dealing with um, espionage, with intelligence, um, so other aspects um, which also have an impact on our everyday life. And we have military uh, components here. We're talking about the fact that uh, Europeans export arms uh, on a global level and that in Europe we keep developing arms that uh, we or the European uh, arms manufacturers want to import um, worldwide. So, um, well, the door is always kept open for these exports, for example, and um, 
Article 41, uh, Paragraph 2, for example, when it comes to uh, joint spending for military action uh, uh, was violated. And why is that being done? Well, because the European Union is preparing for conflicts, um, regional conflicts, global conflicts, um, and the European Union wants to defend its own interests here. And another key word is the fact of a global strategy, which was also uh, mentioned. The European Union said, uh, we want to protect our economic interests, um, trade U, uh, routes, uh, trade interests, uh, and that is supposed to be done as well on a military level, if need be. We are talking about 8 billion euro, which will be invested here. Of course, in a global comparison, this is not a major figure. But what's important here is that for the first time, the European Union took the step of giving itself its own military capacity, its own military budget. And for the first time, the EU arms industry in the member states um, are committed to working together on um, creating larger projects with uh, very far-reaching scope. And uh, that is clearly violating the EU treaty, uh, the Article uh, 41, because that kind of approach is clearly excluded uh, here in uh, paragraph two. And um, we um, therefore have accused uh, the European uh, Union of um, violating the treaty on a German level. We have taken this to the Constitutional Court in Germany. And in Germany, for example, uh, if there is a military uh, budget or military spending, um, the parliament has to, the parliament, the, the German parliament has to be included um, from a, th a certain threshold, a, th a certain sum onwards. And that is not the case on a European level. You can spend as much money as you want, so to speak, without the parliament having to agree to it. And here, once again, the left um, party group in the Bundestag and the German parliament is going to court and says um, that this is violating the EU treaty. And that is why um, the German government should have been opposed to that. So um, we don't know how um, this um, court uh, decision will uh, be taken. We cannot take it to a European court uh, because we cannot uh, start uh, legal proceedings on the basis of the Lisbon Treaty, but what is possible is to start uh, court proceedings in other member states. And depending on the decisions uh, that will be taken, depending on the judgments by the courts, we can take this further. And I think it's very important because with um, these court proceedings, we show where we stand. A lot of people in the European Union are not even aware of the existence of a European Defence Fund. They don't know about a budget line of uh, called military mobility, they don't know what the peace facility is about, um, which sounds very nice, uh, talking about peace and so on. They don't know about intelligence, uh, military components and so on. People are simply not aware of that. And I think with um, taking these matters to court, we also create more awareness. And that's a very important step. And uh, last but not least, it's, uh, I think, extremely cynical that this budget, um, the first budget with the military budget lines was um, adopted in times of a pandemic, a global pandemic, where a lot of people in the European Union uh, talk about protecting their health in times where a lot of families um, had to do homeschooling while working from home because they were told we cannot invest in a more school, in more education facilities, in more technologies for education because we simply don't have the money. And yet, we have uh, investments, 1 million, 1 billion, 8 billion in arms projects, in military projects. That's simply cynical. And I think uh, this is uh, a time which is also being used um, for reorganizing themselves uh, on a geopolitical level, um, maybe um, decision makers try to use the fact that people are not paying attention, but we can also um, 
attack at the same level and create this awareness and really oppose ourselves very strongly against these arms projects. Thank you. Um, for, for, for this input and um, yeah, for setting uh, the, the stage for our discussion. Um, and thank you as well for, for highlighting um, as well the end of the Afghanistan um, mission of, uh, of the German army and the general ending of this, um, of this military mission in Afghanistan and, uh, and the toll it has taken. Um, we have we have a Q and A question, and I would like to encourage everybody um, who's who's uh, joining us and um, who's now um, joining us as an attendee um, to raise your hand if you want to join us here and ask your question live, but also use the Q and A box um, to share your questions. And um, we mean it; um, we we take them up. So um, if you share a question, um, and or if you raise your hand. Um, uh, we've included. And there is one question in the Q&A box um, from uh, Herman uh, Michel. I will um, briefly read it out. Seen from a political point of view, opposing European militarization seems very problematic. The three main political families in the EU, the EPP, SND, Social Democrats and Renew, the Liberals, are positively in favor. Greens are not opposed, especially German Greens in recent positions. Even at the left, uh, Mélenchon's uh, France Isoumise is defending in a quite chauvinist way French military industry and the French force uh, de frappe. The challenge um, for the peace movement seems extraordinary. Um, this, yeah, is, is definitely um, a reality that we have to confront and I would like to um, add to this question and then direct it to, to Leticia and Bram and um, also to Aslam. Um, maybe first to, to Leticia and, and Bram. Um, yeah, the challenges are, are enormous and um, the, the peace movement, um, let's say, is in different states when we look at different member states. Um, we have different, um, different grades of organization, um, different strength and uh, mobilization potential um, of the peace movements. Yeah, but we've also seen very promising um, um, activities, um, especially around um, blocking harbors and uh, preventing arms exports via European harbors in recent months. Um, and I'd like to ask you, what is your perspective on, on the coming month um, and potentially also years now that we, that we have the EU militarization um, process now set sail um, with all the uh, structural and with all these structures um, that you've um, mentioned before are now created and um, and firmly um, and firmly in place um, what is your take on it what what is your strategy or what do you think um, is a promising strategy in dealing with this and confronting the further militarization process of the EU given the state um, of the peace movement and peace organizations or the varying state um, of these organizations um, across the EU and what I'm um, also looking at um, your role as the inner network. Um, what is your take on it um, for the next month? Um, Leticia or Bram, whoever would like to jump in. Well, I can maybe start with a more European perspective, let's say from the network, um, and then can add on, on concrete actions, maybe uh, at national level. Uh, well, yes, definitely the challenges are enormous. And uh, as uh, Mr. Mikkel said, and, and someone else in the, in the discussion, it's huge. And of course, uh, the chances we have to reach our objective are very low. So probably that's our benchmark our motivation is not about, okay, well, let's do it if we are sure we can get to it. Um, mainly, it's, let's do it or let's fight that because it has to be done. It has to be fighted. Whatever the result is at the end, whether we are successful or not, the choice from my point of view as, as a pacifist is to say, well, we just have to do it until the end. Uh, there is no choice because no one is going to do it for us. Um, now, concretely, the things that... Uh, seeing it by step because that's definitely something to approach by step at eu level we know we cannot stop of course the process it has been uh, voted it's over for the next seven years we know we are not going to stop the defense fund for example and other elements and many times i explain that we see ourselves uh, like the stone in the shoe uh, that will always be disturbing 
and that uh, little by little you may have to stop walking. <laughs> it may take seven years, but at some point <laughs> uh, it may have to stop walking. So our project from a very narrow perspective from our program is to continue uh, narrowing, continue challenging uh, what is going on, challenging the problems about the over influence of the arms industry how they benefits continue countering the the official argumentation etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's something that has to be done anyway in terms of bringing the information to the larger audience give material for citizens to understand what is going on that's something that needs to be done because that's the basis we need the information we need to know what is happening uh, and then we can start also imagining something else um, so, well, from the ENAC point of view, that's probably the, the main element. And also, I think something which is important is that it is difficult, but we also see the convergence of fights. Like Uslem was saying, there are major health issues, including in Europe. There are major uh, education issues and poverty issues in Europe increasing. There is the climate change, of course, and the link between climate change and war is increasingly visible and increasingly awareness awareness about this is, is increasing in all areas so a key element i think to help move that the, the issue is also to make all these things clear and to support each other that different struggles can support each other and feed each other um, with with elements information uh, joint support and and etc so that's an important element. Someone trying to fight against climate change is in a way also fighting against, against militarism. Um, yeah, I think Bram maybe probably want to complement. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think at the EU level, we have lost a couple of battles, but um, it's certainly not the end because as Oslam said, who has heard of the European Defence Fund? And I think that's very, it's a good remark. Like a lot of people haven't heard of the European Defence Fund because until now it also, it still was something abstract. Uh, what was it gonna be? I think now that the Defence Fund is here, it also opens up the possibilities to, now it's also vulnerable to criticism and we can, um, we can, we can actually show what's going wrong with it. That's for on the EU level. I think I agree with the remark that on a lot of levels we see increased militarization and it seems that it's difficult um, to resist this. At the same time, we see unprecedented levels of um, unwillingness to, um, to accept this militarization. So if you, if you look at uh, polls among, among the European population, there, there is a huge majority which is against uh, nuclear weapons. There are huge majorities which are completely opposed against uh, a militarized foreign policy, against military interventions. Um, it has almost become impossible for a European government at this moment to do a large scale intervention uh, outside of Europe with boots on the ground just because there is too much, too much opposition against such, such uh, policies. Uh, so what they, what they are doing, they're still trying to um, have their militarist foreign policy, use drones, but they're trying to shy away as much as possible uh, from, put, from putting boots on the ground. So I think it shows that there is a huge resistance against, um, against these kinds of, this kind of hard foreign policy. We, we also see that there is um, widespread mobilization against uh, arms exports. Um, Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabia has become a big struggle, which is being picked up across Europe. We have the example of uh, the different uh, ports in Italy, in France, in Belgium, uh, where actions took place, where this um, Saudi ship was, was um, being chased away by protesters. Um, or, was, or were port workers simply refused to uh, load in these ships. Uh, you have several uh, court cases which are going on, which are actually in some cases successful. In the UK, you have uh, the High Court, which, um, uh, which, um, which, which said that arms exports to Saudi Arabia are unlawful. 
You have a court in Belgium, which has a rule, which has suspended all exports of weapons to Saudi Arabia at the moment from Belgium, which is normally, uh, Saudi Arabia is normally a huge client, the biggest client of the Belgian arms industry. There is nothing leaving the country for the last year or so. So I think those are all, those are huge steps which are being made, which are successes and which, and where we are fighting back um, with, with, with a certain uh, extent of success. And then I also agree with Leticia that um, an important um, thing we have to do, uh, which we should do more than we are doing at the moment is this convergence of struggles. Um, just this month, an international campaign was launched to abolish Frontex, uh, where the links are being made uh, with this military militarized border policies uh, from which um, the arms industry is profiting and where migrants are being um, targeted with military technologies. Um, and I think this is very, um, I think this is a very important struggle. And I, I, I think it's also, um, I'm, I'm very happy to see that there is, that there is a campaign launched now, which is actually challenging this. So I think besides the bad, there is also the good. Yeah, thank you very much for this um, for this kind of optimistic um, outlook. Yeah, and in the chat we have the the link to the Polish uh, Frontex campaign, which is going on at the moment. Uh, I guess Özlem, you would like to um, react to some of the um, statements. Um, maybe you do so, and then I would like to um, come back to the question of of him and uh, Michel, um, also regarding the Parliament and um, let's say the more political side of it. But um, first, uh, the reactions to the statements. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll try and answer the question myself. Of course, I do agree uh, very much to what Letizia and Bram said. And yes, uh, the question is, is justified. The challenges are huge and they are enormous, but we've always had challenges like that that we were confronted with. And I think um, there has always been, um, well, the powers that be and an opposition. Um, and this is not just a case for peace um, policy. Uh, we can look at trade unions, at uh, labor law, uh, women's rights, uh, women's right to vote. Um, was it easy to achieve that? Was it easy to achieve um, LGBT rights to be acknowledged? No, it wasn't. But uh, that doesn't mean that um, we have to follow the powers that be. It rather means that we have to create a balancing power on the other side and uh, counter, uh, develop counter arguments. We, are, we do talk about, or we do have uh, security threats that we're facing, the health situation of uh, people, for example, the um, pandemic uh, licensing of vaccine, etc. These are very uh, topical issues um, that we have to address. And uh, we are told that there is not enough money uh, to deal with uh, the health situation or with the educational uh, infrastructure. And um, on the other hand, money is being spent on um, the arms race, and that simply doesn't make sense. And I think we, people agree to that. Uh, Leticia also mentioned uh, climate change. Of course, uh, climate change is also um, impacted by wars. Wars cause a huge amount of uh, pollution, even uh, the biggest amount of pollution ever. Um, CO2 um, production, for example, is uh, caused to a um, massive extent by the arms industry and um, by uh, waging wars. And of course, we have to create a link between those two topics, but in a different way as it is being done at the moment. And yes, of course, we have to address uh, the production of arms, uh, arms exports uh, on a global level. And we really have um, to tell people what is happening here, what is going on. So this doesn't just happen in the parliament. Uh, 
we can be successful on a political level if we include the population, if we um, have people participate, if we create awareness, as, if uh, we explain things, if um, we uh, really address the topics that um, people are concerned about and create links uh, with peace um, politics and um, with peaceful approaches. And we have to take all these worries um, seriously that uh, people are dealing with uh, and the threats that they feel uh, to their security. But we have to turn the arguments that are normally used around. I mentioned the example of Afghanistan and uh, Europe was um, in, involved in, in the war there. But of course, um, this war didn't happen on uh, European uh, front lines. However, um, we have had an increasing number of military conflicts where European forces were deployed. So um, we have gained some experience in military action. And unfortunately, we have had to learn that this kind of approach will never work, will never be the solution. And even if we manage, uh, for example, uh, to combat uh, forces or uh, terrorist forces in the country, then um, a war will just cause a new problem. So war is simply not the solution. And uh, well, we have to ask, um, of course, um, people who say we have to invest in um, arms, um, to boost the economy, to create jobs. Um, we have to ask what will these arms um, be used for? Um, we have had um, people going on strike, for example, against arms uh, exports, and there have been other positive movements when it came to the ban on nuclear weapons. Um, there are positive developments who uh, yeah, make us, um, see some uh, some light so that's um, where we have to start in Ireland for example the debate on a military or militarized union is very different uh, from the debate in let's say in France so we have to look at how this topic is being discussed on a European level on a global level and address all these uh, questions in a different way of course that's not going to be easy but it's never been easy anyway however that doesn't mean it's wrong or it's impossible I think uh, on the contrary, it's more important than ever to get active here um, because uh, trade wars, for example, can also lead to actual wars and that's very dangerous. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for putting this into perspective as well. Um, we have another question in the, in the Q&A box and this also links to the previous question and um, yeah, relates to the question of also um, the, the political side of what we're discussing tonight, um, that if you look at the European Parliament, um, as, uh, as we've seen in the first question, um, the left um, being the only political group that is clearly opposing um, the militarization of the EU and um, bringing this to broader public attention and, and clearly criticizing it. We've also now seen the Greens in Germany who are um, step by step giving up um, their peace policy, um, let's say, remains of their of their early phase. So the Green Party, as um, as a peace party, as it um, as it came to be, is now step by step abandoning these positions and making a move towards um, a coalition with the um, CDU, with the Conservative Party in Germany, and preparing for this. And then via um, via this process, then um, also abandoning its peace policy positions. That's at least my impression over the recent month. So the question, do we stand alone here on this if we look at the political landscape? Um, first to you, Aslam, and then also to, to Leticia and, um, and Bram. Um, who are our allies? Um, who can we build upon uh, to work with? And um, that may be later on to Leticia and Bram. And to you, Aslam, um, also the question, the European Parliament, um, with its vote on the European Defence Fund, um, voting in favour of the European Defence Fund, the European Parliament has also given away its um, the possibility um, to have any control over the spending of the budget. Um, so that was also um, a disappointment when we saw that the European Parliament voted in favour of the European Defence Fund, giving away any control mechanisms that it could have negotiated. Um, yeah, so these two questions um, to you. The political landscape in the European Parliament, 
um, in opposing uh, this process and the role of the European Parliament as a whole? What um, what is it and what, uh, what can be done? Yeah, also the political instruments that are given, I would say, are a farce. Well, the political instruments that we have, I think, are a farce. Uh, we're talking about uh, a committee on ethics, for example, but that's just a charade, really, uh, because we know that the Commission really uh, sets the pace here. So um, that's not really uh, some uh, leverage that we can use. However, there has been some movement due to a certain amount of pressure that we have exerted. And I think the fact that um, Die Linke took and the situation to court in Germany has created some awareness. Um, our um, commissioner for industry, um, Mr. Breton, for example, raised his eyebrows. Um, by the way, <laughs> that's very telling that this topic is uh, linked to the the industry commissioner and not to the defense uh, commissioner. So, uh, well, the commission knows that it is operating in a twilight zone when looking at the treaty. So uh, things are being taken seriously when we take actions. Well, uh, it probably won't mean that the European Defense Fund will be stopped, um, especially when think, considering the fact that uh, courts uh, take politically motivated decisions as well. But we will create awareness, um, we will um, create well publicity for this topic, and this will help us um, to tell people um, things the way they are. And in the European Parliament, um, we tabled a motion for rejection and the Greens um, did uh, follow it. However, in the German Parliament, the Greens uh, rejected our uh, going to court. So uh, the Greens also <laughs> act in a different way in the European Parliament. They know that a rejection motion will go through. They will follow it in the Bundestag. They know it um, will not go through. So they position themselves differently. We're talking about a uh, electoral campaign as well, um, which is going on in Germany, but still, um, even in the Green Party, we have a lot of young people who um, want to combat climate change and who see the link to uh, the uh, threat of war, to militarization, and um, they do take this topic very seriously. And I think that will change things as well in terms of uh, party uh, politics and so on. And that's a positive, positive development. Um, so that means NGOs also have to address all parties, have to really um, put the pressure on. And on a German level, I can uh, confirm or have to confirm, unfortunately, that we as the left, Die Linke, are the only ones who are really um, being clear about um, yeah, opposing this kind of um, war or military politics. But still, um, our voice is being heard by some people and we won't give up. Uh, we don't have any massive manifestations, uh, peace demonstrations at the moment and so on due to the situation. But that doesn't mean um, this will no longer or will not ever be the case again, because this money will be spent on military action and that means this money will no longer be available in other areas, um, in the area of job creation, in the area of education and so on. So for example, trade unions have also started a campaign against militarization. So there is hope. Uh, there will be a certain movement, I think, uh, but that's uh, of course um, the situation in Germany. I can't speak for other countries. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and this time would also be a question um, towards uh, Bram and Leticia. Bram, you, you touched upon that already, sharing examples um, on how successful campaigns against um, arms exports are working and um, activities and actions that are taking place against arms exports. Um, but I'd also like to ask uh, you and Leticia um, on the question of, uh, of allies. Um, there is a lot of talk about um, that the um, the peace movements, peace organizations um, have to see closer ties to the climate movement and that these two struggles um, need to be interlinked or needs to be a stronger connection. Um, 
So what, um, what, would you what would be your perspective on this? Also on the question of uh, mobilization potential, um, because yeah, as Aslam said, um, looking at it from a German perspective is one thing. We've also seen in the, um, in the chat um, a comment on the situation in France, um, which looks different. Um, so what is your perspective on, um, on that, on the mobilization potential, um, when we look at, for example, um, the Netherlands or France? Um, and then also the questions of, um, of allies and our struggles. Okay, <laughs> so that's quite oh, very open and, and, and difficult questions. Um, uh, my feeling, and I would more talk on a personal point of view, maybe don't want to engage all enough members, but I think the first allies we have are the citizens first and foremost, uh, because they are the ones who will then be able to influence the political parties according to votes or to the decisions they may take, etc., provided that they are informed, of course, and also they are allies in terms of taking action. I think the national le level, what is interesting from what we've heard so far, it shows also how the national level is important, because in many groups you would have very different, I mean, talking about the potential allies. There are some we just don't really <laughs> have any hopes about, but we can see that in uh, all the progressive side, you may have different positions according to national positions. It's not only about, uh, I mean, in the left also, you had someone mentioning before the case of France, which is more complicated even for the left. Um, I think that in Greece, it's also a bit of a problem and, and, and they abstain in, in the world on the defense funds, the, 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 the Greek MEPs from the left because of the specific situation they face uh, with, with Turkey. So that shows that this is a key point is the national level. So it's, of course, we criticize the EU and someone was asking about uh, where the fact that EU would de facto be a war project. I think EU is what national countries does with it. And then you have, of course, what the member states want from it, but you also have what the MEPs do from it. That means that national citizens have much more leverage on the EU what, that they think. That's the first thing maybe we need to do is to make people aware that um, they can influence the EU level too through the national level or through commitment or through engagements. Um, it's not something easy, of course. We know there is no miracle solution, but I would I would tend to, to encourage that this strong connection between the EU and national level. The EU is not happening in a vacuum uh, just on, just per se. I mean, it's, it's really a result of a, a more global trend, which is not only EU, it's also a trend you can see in many other countries in, in the world, this securitization narrative and militarization and, 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 and hard power approach is, is not only specific to the EU, uh, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there are many things to be said, to be honest, on that. And, and at the same time, I would not really know which ones to focus on. Maybe, Bram, you want to complement it? Just, um, just uh, briefly before, before, you come, uh, before you come in, Bram, um, I think there was um, a raised hand um, from, let me see, Ernesto Orlando. So, Ernesto, if you'd like to um, join here and um, contribute, then you're most welcome to do so. Um, so, I just want to um bring that in here so yeah great so we will take you up um just after um Bram has the, the opportunity to um to briefly reply uh, to the previous questions and then uh it will be to you Ernesto um it, it is a bit of a complex question and I think it's mainly a complicated question because it's a challenge at the moment for the peace movement um to sometimes make these connections, which doesn't mean that these connections are being made. So I already saw that uh, Wendela shared a report in, in, in the, I believe in the Q and A uh, on a report which was published recently on um, the carbon footpr footprint of the EU military industries, uh, where you see that um, that that the that the fight against climate change is also an anti-militarist fight. The same goes for um, migration, um, that, which is also a fight against border militarizations. So these, so these circles interconnect and we should 
we should make it visible that these um, that these struggles do interconnect. Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I think. Thank you very much. Um, we are now trying to get Ernesto to join us here. So yeah. Ernesto, hello. Hi. hi. Oh. So thank you very much um, to everyone for this really inspiring uh, panel. Um, I'm not really from the sector, although I've worked uh, in civil society in Afghanistan for some years. So. I was very happy when uh, Oslem has mentioned it uh, quite a bit. Uh, I think these have been really emotional weeks for anyone involved with Afghanistan uh, in the sense that we, it's the biggest failure that we could have imagined for the military and it has passed um, in a total silence, at least from the Italian side. I, I'm an Italian citizen, although I live in Brussels. Um, this It's really shocking how in a way, this uh, failure, with, which could have been uh, emblematic and informative for the future, has, um, has passed in a total silence. Um, what I wanted to, to just ask was uh, really um, how an extra push on the advice and the tools that you can give to citizens, to engage citizens, uh, to bring forward this fight. I mean, I've, I've scrolled through the, the booklet that was launched today. Uh, it's super informative. Um, uh, this said, I think that it slightly falls short towards the end about uh, conclusive actions and uh, what can really be done um, in the sense. I've seen an interesting initiative from uh, the Rosa Luxemburg um, uh, website uh, for calls for a booklet. So for contributions for a booklet against uh, authoritarianism, which is really interesting because that, that focuses on uh, things that can be practical. Uh, and I guess that the, uh, the, the objective is to design something that is then to put into practice. Uh, and maybe whether um, it's an option to also do something similar for peace movements and something that can be also then dispersed and translated. I, I feel that uh, Italy, is a bit missing here um, in, the, in the discussion. I know uh, that Frances Francesco, uh, the other contributor to the booklet, uh, is, uh, is now being published quite a bit on Italian newspapers, but I think that the, there's need to be more. Uh, and Italy is playing an essential role these months. Uh, we, it's, it's very clear. Uh, Mario Draghi is holding the reins while Macron and Merkel uh, will go through elections. I mean, Merkel not anymore, but Germany will go through elections. Uh, so, yeah, um, uh, really, please go ahead and provide us with any information and tools that we can then use uh, and, uh, and put into action. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that contribution. We'll definitely take that on board. Um, and, and also heard your, your comments on, um, on the actions and providing, um, providing more thought. Um, and guidelines on, on how to take action. Um, thank you very much. That's a very valuable um, feedback for us um, in the further process and our um, future work on this topic um, that will for sure continue. Um, I would like to or yeah, direct the question then. Um, again, not an easy question. And uh, Brahm and Titisa, you've, you've been mentioning it before as well. Um, but um, taking up Ernesto's question, um maybe first we're also coming to the end um in a nutshell what citizens can do um in a say maybe a three-step process if we want to um uh, bring it down or something something in that direction and um, let's say um a handy package um that one could take up um if i would like to take action tomorrow um what is possible um what can i do as a citizen um, before we are coming to the closing round, then um, still I would like to ask if anybody else has a question here um, from the attendees, if anyone would like to join and make a statement as well or have, has a question. Um, 
we have a question in the Q&A box. It would be very soothing to hear from you all of you some of your thoughts on how the future of Europe could be without securitization and militarization, or what is the Europe you fight for? Um, maybe we can uh, keep that for the closing round. And that's also a question that I had in mind. Um, and I think this also then relates to the question of how we address citizens or what can citizens um, take up on, on an easy to grasp alternative um, to break it down. This is the alternative uh, that we offer. And this is the alternative that we see that this process is not without alternative. And um, the European Union um, can look differently. Um, as Atisa said, it's also a matter of what member states make out of it. Um, and what's happening at national level. Um, so yeah, the, maybe the last round on, on visions and, um, and alternatives um, in a nutshell, because yeah, I think it would be nice if we can close within the next five minutes. So I would um, first give the um, word to Leticia and Bram. Thank you. Um... Just to clarify, are we supposed to try and answer the two aspects about uh, how to engage and the vision? Because I was not so sure. But I can do both at the same time, so it's done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you... Um, um, yeah. 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 Uh, about, about actions, and, and I fully hear the fact that people want very concrete things. The fact is that a lot of the concrete things you can do depends a lot of also your own situation. So in which country do you live? Uh, what are your own... Uh, resources, potential uh, existing engagements or not. Um, you must be aware that the peace movement is usually quite small with very limited resources in most countries. It's not the case everywhere, but that's the first point to, to take. And if we speak about the EU program, uh, well, it's one person part time in Brussels. It's me just working part time in Brussels. So we definitely don't have the capacity so don't be surprised if you don't see, you know, uh, demonstrations and petitions going around. We just have one person part time. That's all we have as a resource. So definitely we are very limited. We hope it will change over time. That will change if we see a strong, if there is a strong citizen support that would encourage more, uh, more, uh, more funders and foundations to, to, to support our work. It also depends a lot of your own national situation, whether you have a strong peace movement, approach this peace movement, see what kind of, of help they need. If you are more interested in, in, in detailed documentation or research dimension, uh, then provide help. I mean, you can look for these places where you can use that. If you are more about willing to go in actions to block harbors, so it it's not that easy to have a kind of list of, of hand package of something very easy to provide to you to take actions because there is a wide variety of type of actions also depending of your context your availability what you can do what risk you can take or not etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'm afraid I, I would have to go back to those willing to engage and say well you need to find your way to engage that's difficult especially in our current world where we are used to receive everything on internet or on a mobile phone or on twitter and on facebook well Let's also go back to the basics. Let's let's go ahead. Go where you want to find something to do. Um, and the first, yeah, I mean, the first contacts are the peace groups or climate groups. If you are interested in climate and help also climate groups to be aware of the militaristic dimension behind climate issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As regards the EU, we would like, we want to fight for. Um, Let's be very, also some concrete examples. The EU has programs or had at least so far instruments for peace and stability in which, for example, they had a small budget to support civil society in the ground to do mediation, to do dialogue. One thing that we are usually not very aware of is that peaceful ways to resolve conflicts are extremely time consuming and human resources consuming. So that's something where the EU could instead of putting half a billion and to the eight, eight billion into uh, more military weapons without changing what national governments do, if this money was going to train about mediation, about dialogue, about nonviolent ways of, of dialoguing, of negotiating in diplomacy, that would be a huge change. 
I mean, the, the US example is that they have more people to run F-35 than they have diplomats. So that's also the starting point. It's just, you don't have the people to do diplomacy or negotiation, then it doesn't work. So I think the EU could very well be a huge provider of uh, mediation and negotiations talents, training their own EU staff, training people, citizens in Europe and in the field to understand how it is possible to reach uh, peace through dialogue and mediation. Because of course, it's not about dropping weapons and then pretending there would be no more wars and conflicts because we drop weapons. Of course, this is not that easy, unfortunately. But uh, so that's just a small example of what the EU could do, I think, uh, to, to be just different and promote a different uh, approach. Yeah, so I agree, of course, with what Leticia was saying. I think the what you can do is organize. That's how it that's always how it works. That's only you can only create change by organizing. And I think in every uh, European country there are groups which are um, trying to trying to resist and trying to uh, build up alter alternatives or are trying to resist current policies. So, uh, for example, Redes Axi, we have been. Um, We've been doing actions in the in the European neighborhood, but also at, uh, against uh, what the arms lobby has been doing. But we've all also uh, taken actions at arms companies um, to um, to to fight against exports abroad. So I think, yeah, with all that is also being said in the comments, find find the national group and try to support them in any way possible. I think that's the only way in which we can make uh, change possible in the longer run. And then on um, on alternatives, I think um, a foreign policy which is based on human rights and international and humanitarian law would already be a huge step forward. Um, holding companies accountable for what they're doing, not only arms companies, but also uh, other companies which um, which have operations uh, across the world um, try to build a more equal uh, world where uh, causes of, of war are being tackled. I think this is this is what should happen, and I think would also um, uh, would be an alternative if you know that the budget of the United States. Um, State Department, which is um, doing most of the diplomacy, is has the same budget as as two aircraft carriers. That shows something about priorities. So the funding which is being put into the into this war machine is so much bigger uh, than the funding which is being used to create viable alternatives to make um, to to to. Uh, Make the world more equal, uh, more, where more where um, companies are being held to account, where they have to, um, yeah, where they have to, uh, um, where they where they go to court if they do something wrong, instead of uh, yeah, being being uh, shielded from uh, from yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's those are a couple of steps forward, which would be an alternative and would already uh, be a lot nicer. Um, mach ich direkt weiter, Axel? Ich fang mal Shall I versuchen? continue straight away? Um, okay, thank you, Axel. I'd like to try and address Ernesto's question. Initially, I said I, that um, uh, changes in society will not um, take place in the European Parliament or the Parliament is not the only place. Um, but that doesn't mean that I think it's not important to increase the pressure on the level of the European Parliament, um, of course. 
it is important that members of the European Parliament, not just from the left party group, um, should be addressed, should be contacted um, by citizens, by NGOs, and um, well, the pressure should be increased on them. And there should be um, people contacting them, writing to them and saying they don't agree to this kind of politics. And um, that is an important step, and of course, that can only be made possible, this um, increased pressure by getting organized organizing yourselves is very important and um, climate politics is another uh, topic here where people are um, addressing it from all sides from the right or the left side of um, the uh, spectrum so i think it's a challenge um, for us or it's our task really to create a link here between the climate movement climate politics and peace politics and uh, yeah, that's where we have to get organized. And uh, Bram mentioned some examples as well. And when I, for example, um, am an advocate for stopping arms exports, people say to me, and I suppose that's the same in other countries, um, but the employees will lose their jobs. And if we don't export these weapons, then other people will do it. And uh, well, then we have to tell them, we have to just um, change the supply chains. We have to change the whole system. So we have to kind of widen people's horizon. We have to show them what it means to export weapons and what it means um, for the situation of employees and so on, and really have to take them on board of the peace movement. Uh, for example, at the end of the First uh, World War, um, there were uprisings of um, soldiers, of uh, women, and that contributed to ending the war. So if we work together with workers, with trade unions, with uh, NGOs on a European level, I think we would be able to stop um, exports to Saudi Arabia. So there are really some points where we can get active and uh, there are various groups which advocate um, stopping these exports and uh, I think the trade unions are in, uh, an important point of leverage here not because I come from a trade union background but because um, trade unions do have a lot of political influence and um, people always address uh, jobs and employment and sometimes uh, make this link between weapons create jobs and economic growth but this is kind of a well a dead end because this economic growth cannot last and the jobs will not um, be uh, safe forever either so well what would i look uh, what, what would i like uh, things to look like what are, what are the alternatives if um, yeah, I could uh, have a perfect world. Then, of course, I would um, dream of a world where we don't have wars, where we don't have any more weapons, where everyone is equal, um, that we don't have any more inequalities in the European Union and worldwide. And yeah, but of course, I know that's an illusion at the moment. That makes it even more important, though, to keep fighting for it and to keep creating an opposing power and to keep really moving um, human rights forward, humanitarian international law forward. And then a next step would be to really fight um, the arms race um, to join movements which are against militarization, which are in favor of demilitarization. And I think we will find support for all of that in um, among our citizens. I think another important aspect is also the fact that there are inequalities worldwide. And these inequalities, be they economic, social, cultural, and so on, these are the ones that lead to wars. And when we fight against uh, militarization, I think we always have to go back to the cause as well. We have to look at economic inequalities um, or even inequalities in the European Union. Um, and that is what we have to make people aware of, that these inequalities can create armed conflict, and that is a threat. And we should point out that that is the fact, because there is a tendency uh, in the EU, in NATO, for example, um, to look at things kind of uh, symmetrically, 
um, in the same way. Um, and we have to show that things are not uh, symmetric, that there are uh, inequalities. And the majority of the European population, the Chinese, the Russian, the Indian, the US population is not being taken on board, that this is not symmetrical, but and that NATO and the EU are supporting interests of a very few people who support armed conflict. So I think looking at the roots um, would be a very important aspect here. And um, by the way, there are several studies that have been commissioned um, by the left in the European Parliament or have been published by our party group, um, some of it in German, uh, which I published myself, but uh, some of it also in English. Um, for example, um, documents explaining PAS PESCO, um, uh, artificial intelligence for military use, um, those are the topics that are addressed here. And if I can contribute to that um, kind of sensibilizing or creating awareness, then I will continue to do so. Thank you. Bringing it to an end. Um, yeah, we've actually taken up um, some of your uh, publications in the further reading section of uh, the booklet, and that's what I would also recommend. Um, to anybody who's reading the booklet to also consult the, the further reading um, for further uh, inspiration and links. And Axel, you are on mute. <laughs> no, I have not. Just for 30 seconds, don't worry, just for 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, just for 30 <laughs> seconds. Oh, yeah, great. Um, uh, perfect, yeah. That's the, that's the benefits of Zoom meetings. That is, uh, that is an amazing, amazing uh, feature of this online world, uh, speaking for 30 seconds while being muted. Well, what I just said is that um, taking up, Özlem, your point, we've actually taken up some of your um, reports in the further reading section of the booklet, and I shared again the link to the booklet um here in the chat and uh, also recommendation for readers to consult a further reading um for um for more aspects um it's now um yeah coming uh, to 20 to 8 um so i think we can wrap it up here um a big big thank you um to you three to uh, Aslan, Bram and Leticia for joining us here tonight for sharing your perspectives, um, your opinion, and your ideas. Um, also to our participants, um, to our attendees, um, for your questions and uh, for your participation. Uh, to my colleague, um, Luisa, who's been uh, working in the background, um, fixing quite a lot of um, technical uh, aspects. So big thank you um, to Luisa for, for keeping us uh, um, alive here. And of course, to our interpreters, um, for your work tonight and, and for making this possible. And um, finally, and I think your, your closing statements um, made that clear as well, there is potential and, and we have great people working on this issue. And um, yeah, also credits to the European Network Against Arms Trade for their work. Um, that is also reflected in the booklet. Um, and yeah, all the best and success um, for your upcoming um, campaigns. Um, events and actions. Um, and I think um, there is potential for people to join in and um, to join uh, your struggle. So with this, um, I would like to call it a day. Thanks a lot. And um, we will for sure meet again and we'll keep our work on this, um, on this topic. Um, so stay tuned, um, you'll hear from us um, on this rather soon. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.